Ever since I was a kid, it was a dream of mine to legitimately 100% Animal Crossing GameCube. On January 1st, 2021, I became the first person in the world to pull it off. Here's how I did it. It all started exactly one year prior on January 1st, 2020 with the goal of becoming the world's first person to legitimately obtain the post model by saving a billion bells. I accomplished this by predicting stock market spikes using a robust system to determine RNG values. I already made a video on that accomplishment and you can find the link in the description if you're interested. This video will cover the rest of my journey to legitimately 100% Animal Crossing. First of all, what exactly does it mean to 100% Animal Crossing? Well, the agreed definition is to complete the catalog and get all fully upgraded permanent structures around town. I decided to take it a step further and also acquire at least one of every item that doesn't appear in the catalog. Additionally, I would 100% every NES game. Oh, and I also somehow got an impossible to obtain beta item that would consume my town to the point of corruption if I didn't do something about it. Speaking of corruption, that happened too. But that's all covered later in the video. Anyway, with the 100% definition explained, now some rules need to be established for the legitimacy of 100%ing Animal Crossing. First, glitches and cheating devices are banned. Next, time traveling freely is not permitted. However, for the sake of streaming and documenting this challenge, I did allow myself to time travel up to one day forward at a time. Because some days were as simple as checking nooks for new items, streaming for one minute every day over the course of a few years was unreasonable to my viewers. So as long as I played every day, I allowed time traveling forward. And besides, playing Animal Crossing every day for years is something I've done before, and I'm even currently doing with New Horizons, where I've only missed a few days since it was released back in March 2020. So I wouldn't mind 100%ing Animal Crossing without any form of time traveling, but for the sake of streaming and documenting everything, I allowed it strictly following this rule. The next rule is I'm only allowed to play in one town, with the exception of getting Nookingtons, since that's required to 100% the game. I easily could have just loaded up my childhood town, which I legitimately 100%ed, minus the post model, brought over the post model from my new town, and called it a day. However, I decided this was boring, and I added the one town rule so I had to reobtain every item in the game. Finally, the last rule is only Nintendo official hardware, merchandise, and nook codes may be used. I covered this more towards the end of the challenge since these are the very last items I obtained. So with the rules and 100% definition established, let's get into the challenge. As previously explained, this video will cover everything after the post model. With that item out of the way, I was over halfway done, time-wise, to 100%ing Animal Crossing and becoming the first person ever to legitimately do so. My first goal after getting a billion bells was replanting all the trees I cut down for the sake of making money. I saved one fruit tree for the occasion. This was needed not only to get a perfect town rating for the golden axe, but also so bugs and fish would reappear at a normal rate. During this process, I also dug up everything around town, including gyroids, fossils, and buried treasures villagers hid over the last year and a half. I also got the golden shovel. From here, I worked toward collecting all the town model items in the game, which can be placed in your house to make a replica town model layout. Since I already got the infamous post model, I figured collecting the rest of the model items was a fun intermediate goal towards 100%ing Animal Crossing. Most model items are given out as gifts from Tortimer on holidays, some are regular Nook items, and others are awarded under specific situations. Aside from the post model, the next hardest one is the museum model, which is awarded to players after donating everything you can to Blathers. This includes all 40 fish, 40 bugs, 25 fossils, and 15 paintings. As the seasons progressed, I caught each new fish and bug as they appeared while appraising fossils through the faraway museum and talking to Tortimer on holidays. I also stopped by Nooks each day to see if he had any of the four common model items, or six paintings I needed for sale. Oh, and all the while I ran a charity fundraiser to save animals in real life. I designed patterns, thanked people that donated, named new player characters after randomly selected donors, and played NES games. Ultimately, we raised over $800 that weekend to help save animals that were injured or abandoned due to a tornado near Nashville, Tennessee. It was nice to help those animals, and it was also refreshing to play Animal Crossing normally again. That normalcy was short-lived though because Thanksgiving and Sale Day were right around the corner, and those holidays were crucial. Thanksgiving itself doesn't provide any model items, but the items you do get are very effective at boosting your HRA score. The HRA, or Happy Room Academy, judges and scores your house layout depending on what kind of furniture you have. At 70,000 points, they'll give you the house model, and at 100,000 points, they'll give you the manor model. The harvest items you get on Thanksgiving yield over 88,000 points alone, and they don't take that long to get if you know what to do or who to look for. Between 3 and 7 p.m., Franklin, a turkey who's invited to the festivities, discovers the turkey plate is empty and hides around town fearing for his life. If you steal the fork and knife from the table and hand it to him, he'll thank you with the harvest item. The nice thing that separates this from other events is the item he gives you is guaranteed to be new until you have all 12 harvest items. No other item series uses this mechanic sadly, but at least this one does and it doesn't take long to get all the harvest items and ultimately the house and manor model with a bit more furnishing. The very next day is sale day. Aside from the market model Tortimer hands out in the afternoon, Crazy Red, a shady fox who sells rare and common items alike, is guaranteed to arrive in the evening at 6pm. He always has three items for sale at four times their normal price. 
but the benefit is they can be rare items, including nine paintings not available at Nooks, which are needed for the museum. On a normal visit, if you buy his entire stock, he'll close his tent and leave town until next time. However, on sale day, if you buy his entire stock, he'll close his tent but then reappear elsewhere in town with three new items. There's no limit to this, so if you have the time and bells, you can endlessly buy items from Crazy Red on this day. So I just had to put in the time to buy out Crazy Red over and over until I got those nine paintings. After that, there wasn't much to do in December, but I did talk to Tortimer on Toy Day to get the dolly and then the miniature car. The miniature car is not technically a model item, but I had a fun idea for it regardless. I then stopped on New Year's Eve to celebrate two years playing in this town, the first year and a half spent earning a billion bells. After that was January, and with January comes igloos. Starting on the third, each day a random villager in your town will spend the whole day in an igloo where you can play different games with them depending on their personality to win bells or items, including regular nook items and exclusive igloo items, of which include an igloo model and snowy tree model. The most favorable of the six personalities is the normal type, because they'll play a game where they'll show you five items, one at a time, and you can choose to buy one until you're forced to buy the last one. This is a great way to quickly find select items, and it wasn't long until I got both the igloo model and snowy tree model. There is another model item available in January, the lighthouse model. Starting on the 15th, Tortimer will appear at the wishing well and ask you to turn on the lighthouse in the evening while he goes on vacation for a week. When he returns, he'll reward you with the lighthouse model at your front door, as long as you didn't miss a day. In February, on Groundhog's Day, I acquired all nine flower models using each of the player characters. Since you can only get one random flower model per character, I deleted it and remade Player 4 five times to get all nine flower models in one town on one Groundhog's Day. Also in February, Tortimer will want to go on another vacation and ask you to turn on the lighthouse in the evening again. Like before, if you accomplish this task, he'll give you a new item, this time chocolates. In March, I caught and donated the final fish, the loach, receiving the golden rod from Tortimer. Then in April, I got the pink tree model during the Cherry Blossom Festival, and the tree model on Earth Day. In May, I got the dump model on Spring Cleaning Day. And then in June, I caught and donated the last bug, the firefly, completing the museum and receiving the golden net from Tortimer. Here's what Blathers has to say about that. And with the museum completed, I got the museum model. Then I got the tent model, available exclusively from summer campers who appear around town on weekends during summer months, starting in June. I got really lucky and it didn't take me long to get this model. However, I ignored the other summer camper items, so I had to come back later for them. Same goes for the igloo items. I'll explain the summer camper games more then. Anyway, on graduation day, the second Friday in June, I got the Taylor model. Then on Father's Day, the third Sunday in June, I got the locomotive model. The model house was almost done. Now, the only model items left were the 15 station models, available from Tortimer on your town day, which is a random day in July. I opted to only get four this year, one for each player. I chose my favorite looking one and placed it in my house. The final thing was to design the wallpaper. I did my best to design a cliff pattern, and I think it turned out well. My town model replica house was complete, and it was the first one in the world where every model was obtained legitimately. I was very proud of this achievement. Oh, and remember that miniature car item? Normally you can't place it on a grass model, but I used a fancy glitch to do just that. Don't worry, I reset after doing it. It was only for a picture. After that, I took a 9 month break to focus on New Horizons. After I got my fill, I returned to this challenge as promised with a new goal of completing it. The first thing I did was check my catalog to see how much I had completed. After marking everything on the hundo helper, it turned out I was exactly 50% done. I also had most of the gyroids by this point because they spawn after it rains or snows, and I had been playing daily for over two and a half years, so that was pretty cool. The next day was July 4th, and I stopped by Red's tent to see what he was selling. Each year he randomly sells either balloons, fans, or pinwheels. This year, he sold balloons, and I bought them all. However, there are other ways to get balloons as well as pinwheels, but fans are only possible to get from Red on July 4th. So you really have to hope he's selling them, or else you're out of luck 100%ing the game. Thankfully, he sold fans the previous year and I bought them all. From here, I decluttered my town and re-established a perfect town rating to get the golden axe. At this point, I started playing the long game. I needed every piece of furniture, carpet, wallpaper, stationery, umbrella, gyroid, KK song, and more. I established a routine to check nooks and the dump every day for new items, then talk to Copper as needed to see who was visiting my town. Specifically, I was looking for Gracie for her rare shirts, Wendell for wallpapers, and Sahara for carpets. You can get three shirts from Gracie and three wallpapers from Wendell per visit. There's no guarantee they'll be new though, and there are a lot of shirts and wallpapers, so expect many duplicates. The nice thing about Sahara though is you can get all the rare carpets in one visit, as long as you have enough carpets to trade. Anyway, on top of Nook and Copper, every Saturday night I visited KK Slider for a new song. And for one day, Monday through Friday each week, Gulliver washes up on the beach and gives you an exclusive Gulliver item if you wake him up. Like other items, there's no guarantee you'll get a new item, and there's 20 Gulliver items in total, so expect to spend a long time getting them all. Gulliver can wash up anywhere along the beach except for Acre F5. Unfortunately, my town didn't have a bridge near the beach, so I'd run all the way around across the river to check the entire beach each day. 
Thankfully, I still needed a third bridge. After 15 villagers move in, the max amount, Tortimer will appear in a random river acre each day and ask if you'd like a bridge to be built there. If you decline, he'll choose another river acre the next day until you accept. Finally, he picked a beach acre and I no longer had to run around across the river. Finding Gulliver was still going to be a pain, but now it was slightly less painful. So that was my new routine. Nook, Copper, Gulliver, KK Slider, and Gracie or Wendell when they visited town. When Gracie arrives, she'll give you a shirt if you clean her car. You mash A for a while when prompted, and if you did a good job, she'll give you a random Gracie shirt. Otherwise, she'll give you a random regular shirt. And you have to seriously mash A. There's no reason it needs to be this difficult. Thankfully, the GameCube controller has a giant A button, so you can mash with both thumbs, and this method worked fine. You can get three shirts per visit if you log in as different players and wash your car each time. I don't know why Nintendo only allowed three players and not all four, but whatever. This goes for Wendell 2, who will request a fish and give you a rare wallpaper in return. Speaking of wallpapers, I came up with a strategy to quickly get all the nook wallpapers and carpets so I didn't have to check them every day. This method involves befriending a snooty villager and playing a rare game where you trade items endlessly until you choose to stop. After a certain friendship level, if a snooty villager is happy, indicated by them whistling, and you talk to them, there's a chance they'll play this item trading game with you. So I got to work setting this up. I've covered this setup in a previous video on how to earn millions of bells on your first day. The same setup works for any personality, including the snooty Olivia. Once the game starts, the snooty villager takes a random item in your inventory and gives you either a carpet, wallpaper, or furniture in return. The item can be taken again if you continue trading, but thankfully it will still count towards your catalog. So after an hour of trading items, I checked my catalog and successfully got all the nook carpets and wallpapers, as well as a few new furniture, ending the session at 69%. Nice. My next priority was upgrading Nookway to Nookingtons, not only because it was required, but also because there are more items in Nookington. The only downfall is you have to run upstairs, and the extra time doing so adds up. If I only needed furniture, I wouldn't have upgraded until the end, but because I also needed shirts, I had to upgrade ASAP. Many shirts are seasonal, meaning they can only be found during the spring, summer, fall, or winter. That meant I had a limited window of time to get them all, and if I miss out on even one seasonal shirt, I'd have to wait until next year to try again. Nookway sells three shirts at a time, while Nookington sells five. I needed this extra amount to increase my odds of getting all the seasonal shirts in one go. To get Nookingtons, a player from a different town needs to buy something from your Nookway. This was the only exception to the one town rule. I got a new memory card, made a new player in town, visited my 100% town, and bought something at Nookway. After that, I got Nookingtons and deleted that other town forever. Shortly after Nookingtons, I got the last umbrella. Another benefit of Nookingtons is you can buy more candy, starting two weeks before Halloween. Then on Halloween evening, Jack, a mysterious figure wearing a pumpkin suit, will request candy in exchange for exclusive spooky items. The spooky items he gives you are random, so it can take a lot of candy to finally get all 12. This is also the only time of the year to get the Jack in the Box, Jack-o-lantern, and Pat shirt, given to you as tricks for not giving out candy to Jack or villagers. Finally, the last benefit of Nookingtons is on sale day. That same day, Crazy Red sells endless items. Well, Nook also sells grab bags on this day. Unfortunately though, there are a limited supply, but Nookington sells more than Nookway. Grab bags, when open, can contain Nook furniture, carpets, wallpapers, shirts, and pinwheels. Aside from Red's tent on July 4th, grab bags are the only other way to get pinwheels. Since I got fans and balloons from Red, but not pinwheels, I had to rely on grab bags for them. I was able to get 6 out of 8 of them this year. Then came another December. I used this time to visit the island and collect the exclusive island items, including two NES games, Wario's Woods, and Baseball. To visit the island, you need a Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Link cable. Once connected, you can take Captain's boat ride to the island from the dock. It's always summer on the island, so it's nice to visit during cold months. To get the island items, you have to transfer your island to the Game Boy Advance and play games there. But first, you need to prep your island in advance. The most efficient method to get the island items is to bury a bunch of furniture and drop off some coconuts in a shovel. Then on the Game Boy Island, give your islander a few coconuts to make them happy, hand them a shovel, and from there, they'll dig up the buried furniture and replace it with their own. Back in town, Captain will transfer this data to the GameCube, and one boat ride later, the new furniture is ready to dig up. There's about a 1 in 3 chance for a buried item to be an island item, so after a few trips, I got all 12. One more note is a golden tool is needed for the exclusive NES games, so I loaned out my golden shovel temporarily. December is also the only month when you can get the festive items, including two festive trees available in Nooks, before Christmas and the festive flag and candle after. On Christmas Eve at 8pm, Jingle the Black-Nosed Reindeer comes to town handing out exclusive Jingle items. Once you get an item, you can trick him for another one by changing shirts and finding him again. The only problem is there are 13 Jingle items, and he catches on to your trick after the 10th and stops handing out gifts for the rest of the year, even to other players. There's no way around this limit, so it'll take at least two years to get all 13. This is also the only time of the year to get festive paper, which is automatically added to your catalog upon opening a letter written with this stationery. The same goes for the New Year's card and fortune paper, which are obtained exclusively on New Year's Day. The only other stationery like this is the wing paper, which the HRA uses. And with that, I completed the first main section of the catalog, stationery, exactly three years into this town. 
Also around this time, on Christmas Day specifically, snowballs start showing up around town. You can push two together to make a snowman once per day, and if the proportions are acceptable, you'll be rewarded with an exclusive snowman item in the mail. There are 12 in total, and they're not guaranteed to be new each time, so you'll likely have to build a lot of snowmen to get them all. I got decently lucky and got them all after around 30 perfect snowmen. Afterwards, I had some fun building less than perfect snowmen. The only other thing I had left in the winter was a few igloo items I skipped earlier. I already got the igloo model and snowy tree model, so I just needed the last few igloo items. I played that same igloo game as before and got them in no time. I still needed one more item in winter, and that was the last seasonal winter shirt. Thankfully, I got it with a few weeks to spare until spring. In March, I got my second to last Nook Furniture item, followed by my second to last Gulliver item. 19 down, 1 to go. On the 21st, I stopped by the Spring Sports Fair and witnessed Ed and Octavian sink a perfect back-to-back -back ball toss with a net clip. Epic. Then I finally got the last Nook Furniture item, the Regal Bookcase. Another milestone complete. March 26th is my birthday, so I got the birthday cake from home. In April, I finally got the last KK Slider song. Shortly after that, I got the last seasonal spring shirt with almost a month to spare. Nothing special happened in May, but in June, the summer campers returned. I was not looking forward to this because unlike the Igloo games, there are no good summer camper games. Getting furniture is a slow process, and it's only a 1 in 10 chance each furniture will be a summer camper item. I managed to get 9 out of the 10 summer camper items relatively quickly, but got super unlucky with the propane stove. It took over 6 painful hours, but eventually I got it. Then I found where all the luck went. Back to back shovels in the lost and found, which is a 1 in 10,000 chance and an ideal strat for a golden shovel speedrun that no one has ever pulled off. So that was crazy. After that, it was time to get the last 11 station models. I cleaned out Player 4's house and demolished it. My plan was to make a new Player 4 over and over again, then talk to Tortimer and hope the random station model he gave me was new. The problem is I only had 8 hours in game time, and I had to complete chores every time. With 15 villagers, chores took around 20 minutes. For the best case scenario where I got a new station model each time, I was looking at around 4 hours, but that was a 1 in 70,000 chance of happening. Because this was so unlikely, I implemented the first use of Mr. Rossetti. Now there's no rule against Rossetti, but I still tried minimizing using him. The new strat was to complete chores like normal, save the game, then reset if Tortimer gave me a duplicate station model. After dealing with Rossetti, I'd check Tortimer again and repeat resetting until he gave me a new station model. Then I'd drop it off outside, demolish Player Force house, and repeat the whole process again until I had all 15 station models. I managed to get them all in around 4.5 hours. Since I no longer needed a new Player 4, I paid off their loan and finally got the last player statue. And then for fun, I befriended Sable. At this point, I was 42 items away from 100%ing Animal Crossing. One of those items was the compass, the last goal of her item he had yet to fork over. The others were one gyroid, two pinwheels, two window wallpapers, two summer shirts, two Gracie shirts, four lottery items, five crazy red items, five jingle items, and 18 other Nook Code exclusive items. The last few items are typically the hardest to get, but thankfully, I had a strat for the occasion. Wisp, the friendly ghost who appears after midnight once a week if you have more than seven weeds in town, will reward you with one of three things if you catch and return his five spirits. Pull all your weeds, repaint your roof, or give you an item. What it doesn't tell you though is the item is guaranteed to be new unless you have them all. However, he can only give you items that are buyable from the catalog, excluding tools, but including gyroids, fossils, and Gracie, Wendell, and Sahara items. So instead of washing Gracie's car hundreds of times hoping for those last shirts, I just had to help Wisp a few times, and eventually he was guaranteed to give them to me. These spirits aren't always easy to find though. They're randomly placed in acres around town, but may be impossible to reach due to a river or cliff, for example. If you don't catch a spirit, it will go to a new acre. Even if you're in the right acre, the spirit may not even spawn at all because it has similar spawn mechanics to bugs which are inherently not guaranteed to spawn, and then it will move to a new acre since you didn't catch it. And if you have a low town rating due to a bunch of weeds for example, that spawn rate decreases further to as low as 25%. Since Wisp is often used to clear a town full of weeds, it can make finding these spirits a serious pain, especially the last spirit. The strat I used was to have just enough weeds for Wisp to appear, but not enough to lower my town rating, that way the spirits were most likely to spawn when they should. This helped speed up the process, but it was still a pain. Anyway, I helped Wisp each week for the next few months and got all the possible items I could from him, completing the gyroid and clothing sections in the catalog. Then came another sale day for more grab bags to get the last two pinwheels. Unfortunately, I didn't get the pinwheels I needed, so I had to reset the day and try again. This was the second use of Rossetti, but oh well. Anyway, that completed the item section of the catalog. Speaking of Rossetti, I was preparing to use him again because I still hadn't got that stupid compass from Gulliver after over a year and a half, and I only had three more weeks until the new year when I planned on completing this challenge. I was quite defeated with Gulliver and was about to cave in and use Rossetti until I got the compass, but miraculously, in the final month, Gulliver finally cooperated and handed it over. No Mr. Rossetti needed. I was very relieved. 
All that was left now before the Nook Code exclusive items were a few jingle items that I couldn't get the previous year due to the 10 jingle items per year limit. Excited to complete this challenge, I grabbed some shirts and headed off to Christmas Eve. Like last time, I needed to find jingle a few times until he gave me an item. This time, however, I needed specific jingle furniture, so my plan was to save after each new furniture and reset until I had them all. At first, everything was going according to plan, but then something horrible happened. After saving my game with a new jingle item and returning to town, instead of being greeted by one of my villagers, I was greeted by KK Slider, who informed me my town data was corrupted and I would have to start completely over. In this moment, time froze. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Was there anything I could do? I had heard about this before, but I had never experienced it myself. From what I read, people rarely recovered their town, and those that did simply reinserted their memory card and everything was fine. Of course I tried that and it didn't work. Was there anything else I could do, or did I really just lose everything when I was so close to finishing? In comes Kyler, my friend and fellow Animal Crossing enthusiast who's an expert on modding and reverse engineering Animal Crossing. He told me there was hope for saving my town. I backed up my save data using GCMM on the Wii and sent the file to him. This is what he found. All right, all right, man, what's up? What Tell, tell us so, what's going on. So uh, I just tried a couple of things. There's two save copies stored in each save file as a redundant backup. Mm -hmm. In case you have an issue with loading the main copy, it can take the second copy. And as long as that has the good data, it can just copy it back over to the main one. Okay. But it looks like somehow both of them got corrupted. And wow. it's definitely not good. Um, your data is there. I can read the entire thing in ACSE. It all shows up. I, I can see the jingle lamp in your inventory, all your shirts, mm -hmm. the money in your bank. It, none of that got corrupted. The issue is the checksum was wrong. So there's something in your save file when it's loading it that's failing a verification check and it's causing it to be marked as corrupted. When saving Animal Crossing, the values of everything in your save file are summed together, referred to as the checksum. Then on the loading screen, that process repeats, but the value is then compared to the checksum. If the two values don't match, the town is considered corrupted. Kyler forced the checksums to match, sent me back the corrected file, and I restored it to my memory card using GCMM. Kyler, it didn't work. Are you serious? It works in my- it works in Dolphin. I'll, I'll run it again. Okay. I tried a different memory card, and it did work. It was the memory card! Yes! Oh my god, we're back! <sighs> okay. Oh my god, we're back! Let's go! <laughs> so that meant the first memory card got damaged. Still, I was relieved my town was back, but I needed to verify everything was correct. Alright, everything looks good. Um, uh, uh, right off the bat, let's, let's make sure our beautiful uh, town interior looks good. So, okay, we got the post model still. So. Wait, it's different, <laughs> Kyler. It's different? It's different. It did something to my pattern. Oh. Oh. I see. Uh, okay, um, that's that's all right. Okay. Is we, it? We can recover. So then that means that then that means that actually the corruptions that I saw on the second save file weren't the corruptions, but the corruptions were actually in the first copy. Okay. Understanding the checksum was the issue, Kyler found something. Let's see. What shirt were you wearing? Right now? Yeah. This is a custom shirt that I made. It has nine different... It's like the Brady Bunch, but for Animal Crossing. Okay. Um, well, I have good news. That dot is gone. However, you are wearing... Oh, you mean uh, in the... A checkered <laughs> shirt? You mean in, no. <laughs> in the <laughs> game? Yeah. <laughs> Thought you just like my shirt that I'm wearing. <laughs> no, I'm not even watching the stream now. <laughs> okay, say that again. I'm wearing a new Which shirt. Were you wearing in Animal Crossing? Uh, I mean... <laughs> the yellow pinstripe. Okay. Well, were you wearing a checkered shirt at any point? At any point, like ever? Yeah. Uh, during the jingle thing. I don't think so. What the? I mean, it's possible I was. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I know what happened. So your shirt bite actually got corrupted. The bite that was physically responsible for displaying the shirt got corrupted because you had the whatever the white and black checkerboard shirt is. Yeah. On, but I took it off and swapped it with a different shirt in your inventory, and it went back to the yellow pinstripe. So Whoa. Both both of them have corruptions. Every item in the game is assigned a 2-byte value. 
The shirt I was wearing upon saving the game, the yellow pinstripe, has a hex value of 24A3, and the shirt my corrupted save file said I was wearing, the checkered shirt, has a hex value of 24AB. The game's code then takes a lower byte of this value to display which shirt you're actually wearing. So for the yellow pinstripe, that's OXA3, and for the checkered shirt, OXAB. Converting these values to binary, the core system for computational operations, we see a single bit got flipped from 0 to 1. This one difference caused the checksum to fail, corrupting my entire town. Kyler flipped the bit back to 0, and my town was back to normal. Good, there's no corrupted dot. Alright, excellent. <laughs> I can't check the catalog, Nooks is closed. But, uh, we're just gonna assume we're good. Okay, well, because it was literally get it fixed. one bit was flipped. Yes. I've got Hopefully. the yellow pinstripe, my inventory looks good. Kyler literally flipped one corrupted bit that we finally figured out, it took a while. And I think we're good now. <laughs> All right, well, I'll All let right. you finish this run then, man. Just Thanks, let me know man. if there's any other problems. I'll be watching. I will, I'll let you know. Thanks so much for your help, man. I, I am so thankful. <laughs> Uh, no problem, dude. All right, I can't see this run die. I know, that would be... Uh, that was insane. Alright, I'll see you in chat, man. I'll let you know if... Right. I mean, we'll, we'll see if anything else happens. Alright, cool. Later. Later. So that was that. A single bit flip that happened while saving. The two most likely theories are hardware failure, either by the memory card or the GameCube itself, or from cosmic rays that zapping the hardware at just the right time and place, causing a bit flip to occur. We may never know for certain what caused the bit flip, but despite my toasted memory card, at least my town was saved. So, shoutouts to Kyler. And with that, it was back to Jingle. That whole ordeal took around an hour and a half, but I still had enough time to get the last Jingle items. 20 minutes later, got them all. Now all that remained were the Nook Code exclusive items. I thought it'd be fun to cover the source and origin of these Nook Codes to conclude my 100% town. There we are. All right. So here are the codes. I have organized them in the order in which they are possible to get. Animal Crossing came out in mid-September 2002. There's this website called the Crossing Guardian, which is a Nintendo official website. When you go to this website, there's a Pete and Pelly banner that you click, and on that link it says, get your secret code. You type in the month, day, and year to make sure you either have parental guardian assistance or you are old enough. Then you type in your town name, and your player name. It will uh, then spit out a code. So this code right here is for Clue Clue Land D. I just saved one of them. These codes were available for a limited time back in 2002. The first one that ever became available was October 1st, 2002. And this code is different for every town and every player. This is the code that was generated for me, for the town of Billion, with the player name MP16. 20 days later, the next possible NES game would be possible to obtain. Clue Clue Land D came out next, early November. Donkey Kong 3 was available on November 20th. And then I believe this was available for the rest of 2002. And then in 2003, Donkey Kong 3 was no longer available. Then after that, soccer was available for like three more years. However, there would be another time to get these codes from the Nintendo of Europe website at least Clue Clue Land D in 2004 and 2005. But anyways, next, Nintendo Power. Starman came out in the January 2003 Nintendo Power Edition, which I got right here. It's interesting, this is not actually the Nintendo official website. This was the Nintendo Power, as you can see down there. But they had a Crossing Guardian blurb up here in the Nintendo Power. And then here we go, Tom Nook's Special Delivery. They had one of these for every single month for the 03 Nintendo Powers until they got them all. So moving down the list, the Nintendo Bench. There's this gaming magazine called the Tips and Tricks. It came out in 94 and the 100th edition came out in June of 03, right in the middle of when Nintendo was releasing a lot of these codes in the Nintendo Power magazine. So Nintendo and Tips and Tricks collaborated and they decided we'll release the Nintendo Bench for the 100th edition. Then we got the Koopa Shell, followed by the Fire Flower. Two codes were released in the September edition, same with the October edition. And then Punch-Out wasn't available until an entire another year later, when the Nintendo of Europe website came out for when Animal Crossing was released in Europe. And it was on, it was a hit or a miss whether or not you could actually get this to work. It was down in December, it was back up in December of 04, it was back up in January of 05, down in January of 05, and I think it was, and then it was back up, I don't really know. 
but you could get it until basically as long as I remember until they deleted it. So that's that. So they're all Nintendo official. These are the remaining codes. Let's just go ahead and finish this, shall we? Let's do, uh, let's go in order of when they're possible to get. That sounds perfect. Starting with soccer. First code of 18. I mean, it takes a little while, but this feels so weird. I'm typing in a Nook code. This is a Nintendo official soccer code for the town of Billion with the player name of MP16. There we go. First one. Here's your soccer. All right, I think I got that right. Ah uh, yes, you entered your name in a contest to win an NES game. Here's your Donkey Kong Jr. October 20th, 2002. Here is your Clue Clue Land D. Alright. First three. We can check them off the list. Alright, Donkey Kong 3. We're now November 20th. 2002. Alright, anyways. Yeah, that looks right. I entered my name in a contest to win an NES game. I sure did. Donkey Kong 3. Next up, we are now in January of 2003. We just got the latest Nintendo Power. We're flipping through it. We see a page on Feng Shui. Oh, but what's this? Page 98 contains a secret code. What's the secret code? Here we go. What do we got? A Starman has arrived from Nintendo Power! Fast forward to February 2003. We are now ordering every Nintendo Power. We can't miss a single edition. Okay, I see, I see. A cannon! Thank you, Nintendo Power, for my cannon. Let's open our presents now. March 2003, Nintendo official flagpole. All right. I see, I see, a green pipe has arrived. Super Mushroom has arrived from Nintendo Power. A Nintendo Bench has arrived from Tips and Tricks. Nintendo Power, October 2003. We got a Mushroom Mural from Nintendo Power. There we go, all the carpets and wallpapers. There's still one thing remaining. Now, here's what you would do back in 2003. When you went to Game Facts, you would find Punch-Out as a universal code. But if you had integrity, you would wait until Nintendo released an official code for it. We aren't using any of those bad, dangerous online codes. Who knows if that could corrupt your save file. We're going to wait for a safe one from Nintendo. November of 03, Nintendo Power Magazine didn't have it. What the heck? It's not in the December one either. It's so dumb. Why am I even buying these magazines? I guess we'll just, uh, we'll just we'll move on with our lives. It's October 1st, 2004, exactly two years ago since you typed in your very first Nook code for soccer, provided from the Crossing Guardian website. It is now October 1st, 2004. Nintendo of Europe is up, for the Animal Crossing website at least, and they have provided a very similar looking style of acquiring a code. And look, it looks just like the one before. <gasps> A secret code. It's a new one. Please copy the code carefully and enter it exactly as shown. We've done this so many times now. Is this the last one? It better not be another stupid star man. Here it is. Ah uh, yes, you entered your name in a contest to win an NES game. I sure have. It's been years. But we're back. Here is your punch out. Let's go. Let's open this bad boy up. And acquire our final item. Punch out. Our final goal, full catalog. Let's go. We did it! 100%! Wait, that's time! That's time! 100%! Let's go! And with that, I became the world's first person to legitimately 100% Animal Crossing.
But I wasn't done. I had completed the standard 100% definition, but I still wanted to collect every possible item, including those that don't appear in the catalog, and then save at least one of every non-purchasable item, so I always had access to any item at any time. I also wanted to 100% the NES games. Oh, and I also wanted bug plaques and fish weather vanes on every house, since they were permanent additions to town structures. With my new goals, I got to work. The first thing I did was get the Ice Climber and Mario Bros. NES games. These two items are only possible to get by scanning specific rare e-reader cards. I then redecorated my basement to house all my NES games. I was very pleased with the end result. Next, got to work reacquiring a few gyros I lost while getting a billion bells. Since you can't reorder gyros from the catalog, I had no choice but to find them again. While running around town digging stuff up, I encountered something bizarre. Something that shouldn't exist. Paper airplanes. The paper airplane is a beta item that will duplicate itself until it crashes your game, and is supposed to be impossible to get, except with a cheating device. And yet, somehow, I got one, and it already duplicated. This was both intriguing and terrifying. Was there any way to get rid of it? And how did I even get it in the first place? I quickly realized this was another bit flip event. Every spot in town is represented by a value, even nothing, which has a value of zero. The paper airplane has a hex value of 8,000. Converted to binary, we see the only difference between 0 and 8,000 is the upper bit. So once again, a single bit somehow got flipped from 0 to 1, creating a paper airplane out of nothing. I knew each paper airplane would duplicate itself once to an adjacent space if you entered the acre it's in and reloaded the map. Likely an early test of flowers growing on a new day. Additionally, it could be picked up and thrown with a Z, but would then softlock the game. So for the time being, I continued about my business making sure not to enter the wishing well acre. I got to work on the bug plaques and fish weather vanes for all the houses, which meant I needed to catch every bug and fish for all four players. I placed one of each in player two's house. Bugs and fish are considered items after all, and can't be ordered from the catalog. I also got five January tickets from Nooks, since those are items too. Then, I came up with an idea to move the paper airplanes where they could be safely contained. I tested out if it was possible to surround the paper airplanes with other items so they couldn't duplicate. Lo and behold, this worked perfectly. I also discovered it was possible to remove a paper airplane by dropping an item on it. Using these properties, I was able to relocate and trap the paper airplanes in a safe containment zone. This impossible to get item made a fine addition to my 100% town. From there, I continued catching every bug and fish for every player and reobtained all 25 fossils since they also couldn't be reordered from the catalog. By September, I had caught all 40 bugs and 40 fish for all four players and got all 25 fossils that I needed. I also found all the missing gyros I needed as well. I then continued collecting the five tickets for all 12 months, the nine different flower bags, eight seashells, six fruit, four golden tools, three pieces of trash, two saplings, a signboard, grab bag, candy, pitfall, mushroom, spoiled turnips, unidentified fossil, knife and fork, and expired exercise card. Those last two items can't actually be stored, so I just kept them in player four's inventory. By December, I had acquired every single item in the game, except for one, an orange. I knew villagers would give away fruit after talking to them enough. However, from past experience, I knew there was a bug in the game's code that made it impossible to get oranges in town if your native fruit was pears. But I also knew oranges were possible to get if your native fruit was peaches. This town's fruit was apples, so I wasn't sure. I talked to Anacati for over an hour and got many pears, cherries, and peaches, but not one orange. Kyler later looked into the game's code and discovered when the game randomly chooses a fruit to give you, it picks a decimal value between 0 and 4 and converts it to an integer, making it impossible for a 4, an orange, to ever be chosen. To make matters more confusing, if the game picks your native fruit, it will add 1 to the value and give you that fruit instead. Because the value for a peach is 1 away from an orange, it makes it possible to get oranges if your native fruit is peaches. Because of this flawed programming, I was out of luck getting an orange in town. Thankfully, I knew of another method using the Game Boy Island. Every 4-7 to seven minutes, an item floats by, switching between one of three things. During specific hours of the day, this item could be a piece of fruit, and it can be any of the fruit, including oranges. By giving your islander a net, they can catch this floating item, and with good timing, snag the fruit. After giving the islander some other fruit it likes, it will then drop the fruit it caught, and you can pick it up after returning to your island. So I got my island set up and multitasked, organizing the player houses while trying to get an orange. I was having really bad luck, because I finished organizing all the houses and still hadn't got an orange. But I did see Gulver in the ocean on an island trip, which is very rare, so that was cool. By this point, I had done literally everything in the game except get an orange in 100% the NES games. So my multitasking continued to find an orange while I played NES games. My definition for 100%ing the NES games was completing everything that could be saved to the memory card. This included completing all 100 rounds both A and B in Wario's Woods, as well as achieving gold ranks in all the time races. 
I also needed to get a perfect score in every DK Jr. math game, unlock every Excite Bike level, and get the high scores in every other game mode. It took me a while, but I finally got into the swing of Wario's Woods. I was regularly distracted, however, with orange hunting, so I didn't play my best. But thankfully, towards the end of round A, I finally got that stupid orange. On my final trip to the island to collect my orange, I did encounter a whale, which is so rare, most people thought it was only a myth until recently. I planted the orange for an orange tree, and stored one of them in Player 3's house. With the final item obtained, I was able to focus all my attention on the NES games. I completed Round A in Wario's Woods for the first time in my life, then I completed Round B in one sitting, also for the first time. I set high scores in both modes of Balloon Fight, I set a high score in Clue Clue Land, I set the top 10 high scores in Clue Clue Land D, I got perfect scores in every exercise mode in DK Junior Math, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong 3, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong Jr. I got best times in every Excite Bike level. I got a high score in Golf. I got a high score in Ice Climber. I beat 20,000 points in Mario Bros. I set high scores in both rounds of Pinball. I KO'd Glass, Joe, and Punch-Up. I got a high score in Baseball, Soccer, and Tennis. And finally, I achieved Gold Rank in all-time race difficulties in Wario's Woods. And with that, I officially 100%ed every NES game in Animal Crossing, thus completing the challenge. Not only did I 100% Animal Crossing and all the NES games, I also obtained every possible item in the game, plus an impossible item, and stored at least one of every non-purchasable item in the player houses, so I always had access to any item at any time. I also got a bug plaque and fish weather aim for all four player houses. To conclude, I'll show off all the player houses in my completed catalog. Let's confirm the catalog is complete. 601, purple star, 67, purple star, 67, purple star. 247 purple star 64 purple star 64 purple star 127 purple star 25 purple star and 55 purple star all right so here is of course you know the most beloved room in every animal cross game ever the model item house layout i've had this one since 180 hours but i'm still so happy about this room this item right here I'm the only person in the entire world that has this item legitimately by getting 1 billion bells with no glitches and no nook codes. And there it is, proudly displayed right there. The one and only post model. That's right. All the interactable models can be reached. And of course, my second favorite room. This is probably my favorite basement design I've ever made. This ended up being way cooler than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was mostly just going to be like a, an NES storage room, but this ended up being like a sweet Nintendo room. You don't know how badly I want Super Mario Bros. and Legend of Zelda in this room. I'm just waiting for a bit flip to miraculously give me Super Mario Bros. or Legend of Zelda. I've had three bit flips in this town, and, and one of them gave me an airplane, which is cool. One of them corrupted my town. And one of them changed my tan from a dark tan to a light tan. I have ice climbers. I have ice climbers in Mario Bros. I have those legit. What are these mushrooms? Oh, these mushrooms are the mushrooms you can find around town in October. I thought that'd be cool decoration. Anyways, moving along. The upstairs, this is this is not a permanent room. This is the only room from all the player houses that I can modify and update as I wish to. It's currently decorated as a snowman theme, cozy cabin room. But yeah, I can decorate this room however I want. I have storage space in the other player houses for the rest of these items. They do not necessarily need to stay in this house. It'd be a little terrifying in real life, all these snowman faces. But in Animal Crossing, I like it. It's pretty cozy. Oh, and just to confirm I've played every day, here we go. The previous year, 2023. I showed this on 2023 to confirm I played every year, every day of 2022 as well. And the previous year. If you talk to Tortimer at the Wishing Well, you'll get a red key on that day. Anyways. Moving along. Let's go show off the other three player houses. Starting with Opego's house. This house stores all the series items, including the Spooky, Harvest, Jingle, and then this space right here would be the Snowman series, which is currently in, in my player house. These things right here, the shirts would fit in the dressers and wardrobes. These would go on the Snowman table. 
It's kind of incredible how perfectly all of the series items fits into one room. Next, the basement. The wardrobes on the left and the right store miscellaneous items, including raffle tickets, shells, fruit, golden tools, fossil, mushroom, candy, pitfall, grab bags, signboard, the saplings. I think I'm missing a few things. But generally, just anything that you can store in a wardrobe that isn't like a shirt, wallpaper, or carpet. And then all the other items. The summer camper items on the left. We got the post items over there on the left. We got some extra event items here. The moon, telescope, aerobics radio. And we got the dummy in the bottom right corner, which is a beta item you can get from the Igloo games. Oh, and the island items. All right, moving along upstairs, we got wardrobes on the left store all of the window wallpapers. Blue wardrobes on the right store all of Sahara's carpets. Green wardrobes in the middle store all of Gracie's shirts. And then the other, the remaining Gulliver items, one by one Gulliver items in, uh, in some sort of order are also stored up here. So all the Gulliver items are in this house, all the island, summer camper, so on and so forth. Next up, we got Tetra's house. This house stores two things primarily. Uh, gyroids, organized in catalog order from left to right. What a very welcoming house. And then the basement. There's 127 of them in total. This was a chore to organize these things. I think that I ended up spending like five or six hours getting them all organized. Yeah, this was a chore. And then a dummy item in the bottom right because there's one extra spot. Then upstairs, Station models. I have all 15. The 15th one is in my player house. If I had realized how cool this would have looked, I probably would have just gone ahead and got a duplicate of the last station model. Oh well, maybe that's a future project. But there's there's space allotted for all the igloo items. If uh, you know, whenever I choose to remove those from my main player house, and that's where the igloo items will go. That's where the that's the space that is allotted for them. And finally, the last house which has all the other remaining. Basically a museum is what this house is. Main floor has all 40 bugs. It's got all the ocean fish and the arapaima and the pond fish. And it's got two of the fossils because all the other fossils are stored down here. I got a duplicate of every, of every fossil as well, because why not? And I organize them in a way. And it, it's a miracle how everything perfectly fits. Like, it's incredible how you can fit all the fossils, fish, and bugs in one house with one, I'm not even kidding, one space in the house to spare. I don't know if that was planned, but it's insane how perfectly that worked out. And I put a dummy item there. I got three dummies. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't have much space left to store things. I've, I, it's incredible how everything worked out perfectly. And then the upstairs has all the other fish in catalog order, with a few exceptions of a few fish for aesthetics. Anyways, that's all of them. This has been my journey to become the world's first person to legitimately 100% Animal Crossing. Thanks for watching.